I'm going to talk today about my experience using the Flarehawk expandable cage. Um, and I'm going to take you through a discussion um, from how I use it in open cases and how I do it endoscopically. So, you know, why, why are we even talking about expandable cages uh, in general? And I think one of the most important uh, aspects of achieving a successful outcome for the patient is the importance of a sagittal alignment. And so restoring lumbar lordosis has been shown in many studies to correlate with uh, improvements in quality of life, because that's what we're really talking about. And so you can restore lordosis by either lengthening the anterior column or shortening the posterior column. And expandable implants that give you the opportunity or maximize the potential to restore lordosis. Um, and so that's why I think expandable cages are so important. And so, you know, obviously there's multiple options to stabilize and decompress the spine. Um, and all of these have advantages and disadvantages. Um, I perform all of these surgeries. And so I'd just like to talk a little bit about what our options are. And of course, um, why, when are there, uh, ALIF is an absolutely wonderful surgery, but there are certain uh, instances where you don't want to perform an ALIF. Uh, especially in the higher lumbar levels, it can be really difficult to mobilize the vasculature. And there is an incidence of vascular injury. And in men at the L5-S1 level, um, there is a 2% uh, incidence of retrograde ejaculation. Um, and so, you know, that's something you really want to uh, discuss uh, with the patient. And so some people may opt to not have an ALIF. And the lateral access uh, with the XLIF and, and OLIF, um, sometimes there's access issues at L5-S1 and L4-5 with the hyaliac crest. Perhaps this, the person has had surgery before and it's going to be some scar tissue. There is a need for neuromonitoring, so therefore that increased the cost of the procedure. And even with neuromonitoring, there's a, up to 30% incidence of transient neurologic symptoms. OLIF, um, again, uh, you same issues with the lateral, but also um, at L5-S1 can be very difficult to do and you need to use, an, most people will use an approach surgeon for L5-S1. Um, and, you know, as especially with training in the United States, these anterior approaches uh, utilizing an approach surgeon, the way training's going these days, there aren't very many general surgeons left. They're all fellowship trained to do one specific task and in getting uh, a general surgeon to provide access in the future is going to be difficult. And then, of course, uh, with a posterior approach, um, there is definitely the risk of dural tear. Uh, you require the smallest cage profile to insert it or to, uh, to use, and um, there is a risk of neural injury. So these are reasons why you might want to not do these types of surgeries. So what I'd like to do next is just run through a couple of clinical scenarios um, where I've done open MIS and uh, endoscopic cases. So this is a guy who's uh, my age, uh, who was a former MMA fighter, who has the worst luck imaginable. He started off with just a herniated disc following a match. Uh, and years later, a recurrent disc that led to a fusion, and then a motorcycle accident that led to another fusion, and then an adjacent segment degeneration with another fusion. And he had a, a, an L2-3 plif because he had multiple posterior surgeries, and then presented with this L1-2 disc extrusion ab above a previous multi-level fusion. Um, and so, you know, what are your treatment options? You know, this is a multi-level fusion, so you have a giant lever arm, and an adjacent segment disc herniation. So I chose, because he had already had previous surgery, I did a posterior procedure. You see in here, these were your standard anatomic peak cages by Medtronic, had a very nice result. And this is the L1-2 level. And I was able to do, uh, remove the, do the, perform the discectomy and use a bilateral cages. And if you think about the high lumbar L1-2, L2-3, there isn't a whole lot of space to place a cage. Um, you have to co do complete facetectomies in order to place your standard cage. And when you get much above, you know, eight or nine millimeters, if you're putting in a static cage, that means that you need to get nine, 10, 11 
uh, millimeters in width and you just run out of room. So I was able to insert uh, the Flarehawk 7 at a profile of seven by seven millimeters and expand it to 11 by 11 with six degrees of lordosis. And if you notice here at L12, the, the profile of the end plates, you see that it very nicely follows the, uh, the, the end plates and it does create some lordosis. Obviously I, I um, supplement the, the instrumentation uh, with posterior instrumentation on all my cases. But here you are, this demonstrates the ability to insert a cage at a small profile to recreate lordosis uh, and to recreate the dissipate height uh, in a single uh, surgery. And if you talk about what the cross-sectional volume is, the area, this was an 11 by 11, uh, 11 millimeter wide by 11 millimeter high by 26 millimeters long. The previous cages were eight millimeters wide by eight millimeters high and 24 millimeters long. You calculate the cross-sectional volume, that's a tremendous amount of volume um, and tre tremendous amount of support and it actually approaching the size of an ALIF implant via posterior approach. So I think this offers a significant advantage if you're choosing to do a surgery posteriorly. But you know, expandable cages are really not a new concept. There are multiple devices on the market and all of them increase height. Some of them increase width, some increase lordosis, but few achieve all three and even fewer are designed to be delivered endoscopically. Um, there are some disadvantages of expandable implants because most of them expand only in one dimension. And, and, and again, you saw in a previous slide from, from Chris that, you know, force equals ma uh, uh, mass over area. And so if you increase the height only in a small area, you're, you're creating focal stress and that leads to micro implant fractures and can lead to subsidence, which is associated with uh, a the worst clinical outcome. Uh, in addition, uh, some of these uh, expandable cages that the mechanism that is used to expand the cage takes up the space that you want for bone graft. And so you have, you have less surface area for bone fusion to occur. And the mechanical devices are expensive to a manufacturer. And so, especially here in the United States, it's so difficult to get any new implants approved in hospitals because of cost. And if you have an implant that costs $5,000 to manufacture and companies need to sell it for eight or $9,000, well, guess what? That implant's not getting approved in your hospital. So cost is a major, major factor. Um, I'm just gonna run quickly through these. These You've already seen uh, the Flarehawk 9 goes in at nine by nine millimeters and it can expand up to 12 millimeters uh, in height and 14 millimeters in width with lordosis of 0, 6, 9, and 15 degrees. The Flarehawk 7 cage, which can be delivered endoscopically, uh, enters at seven millimeters by seven millimeters and can expand to 12 millimeters high by 11 millimeters wide with up to six degrees of lordosis. So let's um, talk about an MIS TLIF. Uh, this is just a garden variety, isthmic spondylolysis, bilateral pars defects, and a, a right side of foot drop. Um, so, I mean, pretty straightforward clinical indications. Um, what are your treatment options? You can do a standard PLIF. Um, some people might consider just doing an endoscopic foraminotomy. Um, an A-LIF would be a good case, uh, you know, reason to do this case. Um, I chose to do an MIST lif And I just did a tubular decompression with complete facetectomy to open up the area to place the uh, Flarehawk 9 cage in this particular uh, case. I use a standard uh, end plate preparation with curettes and pituitary arrangers, um, and then place the cage. And of course I supplement with um, the uh, posterior pedicle screws. Uh, yeah, I use image guidance. But if you notice here, you see the, the tantala markers on the, the peak part of the cage, they really expand. And I was able to recreate the lordosis and fit the profile. And one of the, one of the important concepts or one of the things that I came to realize is that if you put lordosis into these cages posteriorly, it's a reverse wedge and it's going to really resist posterior migration. So you're not going to see migration of these cages posteriorly because you've, the, you've basically creating a reverse wedge. 
But I think that's one of the other advantages of the expandable cages with the ability to restore lower doses and by definition then that resists uh, cage back out. So here's the, the uh, O-arm images, uh, seeing the placement of the cage, very large footprint for a single cage and the amount of bone that you're able to pack. And what happens is, is it comes out both uh, laterally and anteriorly and um, you can really pack a tremendous amount of bone in here. It's extremely important with the expandable cages that when you do your disc space prep that you need to take more disc material than you would normally because you need to give uh, space for the cage to expand and you need space for the bone graft. So whereas with <clears throat> the titanium implants that, uh, um, where you don't need to, um, I mean the static titanium implants where maybe you're relying on bone growing into the cage, you don't necessarily need to do such an extensive discectomy. I think it's of paramount importance with expandable cages to do a very wide discectomy. So this brings to me to endoscopic surgery. And this is what my, where my true passion lies. And we'll talk about both the transforaminal and interlaminar um, applications. So obviously we've all talked about what some of the challenges are, you know, the constraints of Camden's triangle, the bony constraints, there's some geometrical constraints of the tubular attractor uh, and the endoscope. So, you know, you, you're, what we're trying to do is fit a square peg down a round hole and that creates some uh, geometric challenges. And of course, with the endoscope, how do you get um, instruments down that are going to effectively uh, remove disc material in a, in a, um, an efficient manner? Because really, if we don't have good end plate preparation, it doesn't matter. You're going to have, you're not going to have a good outcome. And then of course, you need to be able to deliver a significant amount of graft material in order to get a fusion. So, with the transferamal approach, obviously we tried to design an implant that can be delivered safely through Camden's triangle, but at the same time having the largest footprint to avoid subsidence. And, um, and also uh, we need to design instruments that can effectively um, prepare the end plates. So again, we showing here the uh, expandable cages. We've already had this slide. Well, let's talk about the access. So, um, we've designed some uh, tubular attractors to facilitate um, the deployment of the cage after you've performed your decompression. And I have a nice uh, little animation to show you. Um, again, utilizing the concept that JoyMax, uh, we teach in the JoyMax courses, especially with the interlaminar and the uh, transferamal approach, where you utilize the bevel of the tubular attractor to to rotate and retract the dura or the exiting root out of the way so that you can protect it when you're removing disc material or inserting the cages. So obviously, I think the most important thing is the end plate preparation and there's uh, shavers and curettes and things. Um, and one of the epiphanies that I had was that, you know, we've been trying to design all these instruments to work down the working channel uh, of the endoscope but that limits you in, in the working area that you have of the instrument. And I said, well, if we're utilizing the uh, tubular retractor as a retractor, why, do, why can't we just place it, uh, an instrument into the disc space and then place the endoscope over the instrument? So rather than placing an instrument down the endoscope, why don't we place an instrument up the endoscope? And that was the epiphany that we had. And we've designed all these instruments between uh, articulating curettes and regular curettes and wire brushes um, to work in this manner. And in fact, we've applied for a method patent for that um, concept of working up the channel rather than down the channel. I've been working with JoyMax to develop uh, a spinner, um, which I'm gonna show next. Uh, the shrill spinner um, which, you know, if Dr. Wagner can have Wagner's arch, I think that somebody else should get some thing for them. Um, and since this is my talk, I get to say whatever I want. So I'm just, just throwing that out there. Um, this is under development and, and not yet for sale. But as you think about how we can 
remove this material in an efficient manner, wouldn't it be nice to have an instrument that inside the disk space can spin and morselize disk material? And the inspiration for this came when we were uh, last summer and we were sitting on my boat making uh, frozen mudslides using the Ninja Blender. Um, why can't we morselize disk material and just irrigate it out the, the endoscope? And so using this spinner to uh, morselize or using this hooligan, I'm sorry, to morselize disk material and irrigate out may speed up the process of removing the disk material and the ability to articulate and wand within the disk space will help for efficient removal of disk material. But this is under development, it's not yet for sale, but hopefully it'll be coming out uh, soon. So this is a, we talked about what the advantages of being able to use the endoscope. And this is in one of my endoscopic fusions. In the very early stages of this material removal, you can actually see the interface between the cartilaginous end plate and the bony end plate. And this was just with the regular disc shavers. Obviously there's a tremendous amount more work to be done here, but I just, I wanted to, show you the interface here and what you can do and what you can see inside the disk space when you try to prepare. So before you deploy a cage, you have the ability to go in and inspect the end plate. And I can't remember if this is my case or Dr. Gardaki's case, but you can actually see the amount of bony end plate removal that you can achieve. And it's nice to be able to, to use your endoscope to inspect uh, before you deploy a cage. So, um, the way I envision uh, the, the, the transferaminal deployment of a cage is you know, just using the standard join max technique that we always use with the reaming and drilling to, to actually enlarge the bony constraints and enlarge Camden's triangle. Um, and then like what Dr. Uh, Wagner was saying, you know, to get into the disk space, it's, it's not the same approach. It's a little bit more steep and so we want to be able to redirect and enter the disk space and we can do that by inserting a guide wire into the disk space uh, uh, under direct visualization, remove the smaller uh, uh, tubular attractor and insert a larger one that's more amenable to placing a cage. And so as we employ that larger uh, tube, we can protect the nerve root and dura and visually inspect the disk space and then after the disk space prep, and we've determined we can then insert the um, flare hawk cage, the expandable cage, um, and, and then post pack with bone. Um, the ability to introduce lordosis um, is also very important because now you have the ability to um, restore normal anatomic alignment. And here, you know, just the standard uh, joint max technique, we're protecting the dura, protect, and we're far away from the exiting nerve root and the ability to expand in both height and width and introduce lordosis and allows us to put a tremendous amount of graft material in. So that's how I envision the uh, transferaminal case to go. Uh, this is how we design the technique. And this is actually putting it into practice. So here's a, a lady with a third recurrent disc herniation um, at L4-5. Um, not that impressive in the um, axial, but um, she had a foot drop. Um, I had performed two uh, tubular MIS surgeries in the past. And so coming in transferamily to resect that disc um, with avoiding all of the scar tissue, again, another advantage of the Joymax transferamal technique for recurrent disc herniation, you can avoid all that scar tissue. So here you see the, the tubular retractor from the Joymax technique and I've done the discectomy, so I've done the decompression. And now um, after uh, performing that, I redirected, inserted the slightly larger tubular retractor that has an outer diameter of 11 millimeters and inner diameter of, of 10 millimeters, inserting the, the cage this with the uh, expandable peak cage with the shim, so the outer shell, the inner shim. And this is the uh, post-op CT, uh, intraoperative CT, I should say, from the O-arm. But look at the size of the cage. It's a pretty significantly uh, large uh, implant uh, delivered via an endoscopic transferamal approach. Intraoperative x-ray showing the size of the tube, the amount of space uh, for the exiting nerve root, 
um, and we're protecting all the neural structures. Oops, let me go back to that. And uh, this is the post-op x-ray uh, showing the, the cage and the posterior stabilization. The interlaminar technique is uh, very stand the standard decompression technique uh, using uh, the Joymax interlaminar that, that Christoph and, 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 and uh, Ralph have really uh, shown us how to do. Um, but there isn't a whole lot of room to insert a cage. And so um, I was thinking that if we inserted a retracted that had a very exaggerated bevel, that would expose more uh, facet and you'd be able to rotate the bevel to retract the dura and expose the facet and then ream the facet to give yourself more room and then redirect to get a better trajectory. And this is what this animation shows with the ex ex uh, exaggerated bevel rotating it so that we push the dura out of the way and then taking that those side cutting drills and just slowly multiple passes retract the dura out of the way to get a better trajectory. And here you are, uh, Ralph, you know, if you're L5S1, imagine doing this bilaterally, um, uh, inserting uh, cages, Flare Hawk 7 cages, and expanding the amount of uh, surface area that you'd be able to support um, and the amount of graph material you'd be able to, to place in the uh, intervertebral space. But by doing it endoscopically, you're able to uh, visualize the nerve root um, and resect facet and give yourself enough room to place the cages. And that's exactly what I did. Here is a, a inner laminar case, the Flare Hawk 7s uh, deployed. And as I withdraw the retractor tube, you can see how the dura was retracted. So, so why expandable cages here? I just demonstrated one implant system that allows me to deploy a cage using open, MIS, and endoscopic techniques, you know, based upon what's best for the patient. You know, there isn't one technique that's best for all patients, and you know, I like to have options. Um, the concept of the adaptive geometry of the cages conforms to the end plates to give you a lot of surface area um, that reduces the uh, risk of subsidence. And I think obviously expandable cages will give you the opportunity to restore lordosis and sagittal balance uh, while uh, putting the largest cage possible with the smallest insertion profile. So in my opinion, and I really believe that the endoscopic decompression in combination with the uh, expandable cages is an extremely powerful tool that it gives us a, a 360 degree fusion through a single approach performed by a single surgeon. And I think that's important. And, and the reality is, is that now this makes outpatient endoscopic fusion a reality. So thank you. Just like uh, for everybody that's watching, you know, I have a, a Facebook group called the Joymax Endoscopic Surgery Group. And it's uh, right now we're over 400 surgeons from around the world and we post cases and post clinical problems. And um, it's a really good opportunity for people to show their work or ask questions because some of the people that have done the most cases in the world are on this group and answer questions if you have a clinical problem. Also my YouTube channel, I have lots of uh, how I do it uh, uh, videos where we do some clinical problems like targeting or why do you even want to do it? How do you use the shrill? I keep trying to get Ralph to, to, to do a video, but I can't get through to, I have to go through his people and his agent won't let him talk. Um, and again, we talked about the SPAR uh, discussion. Uh, Dr. Gardakti and Dr. Derman are both endoscopic spine surgeons. We're going to talk about indirect and direct uh, decompression. And I'll send you guys all the links if you're interested. So thank you. Well, great talk. Great talk, Paul. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, Rolf, Chris, for the great talks today. Let's Let's wrap it up with some questions. Um, Ralph, you wanted to ask, uh, answer life, um, the question L4, L5, nerve root damage. Um, yeah, well, that's a, that's, that's a good question. Um, but actually, the, the principle is the same as for the endoscopic, uh, normal endoscopic decompression. So to avoid um, exiting nerve root damage, um, as well as traversing nerve root damage, is that you actually uh, place create space in the foraminal area and keep 
the first approach tools more posterior um, so that you don't enter the disc lateral to the facet joint. That's the most dangerous situation is that when you actually have um, your first approach tools and the dilators as well as the reamers lateral to the, um, to the, to the facet joint. Um, and again, I, um, I go back to the trans SAP approach. So be sure when you do that to start, especially for, for degenerative cases to start more posterior. And I learned that from the L5S1 area where you always too, uh, uh, too anterior no matter where you enter it. The reason why is that you have a large facet joint um, size um, in width and also short pedicles. So it's the same thing. You, you, you have to uh, restore a normal anatomy so you can place um, your, your instruments. And I think that's, uh, that's the way you avoid it. One big, um, I think one big misunderstanding is that the lateral, the far lateral approach, you have to be very careful because the far lateral appro uh, approach that is actually um, reducing the three dimensional dimension of the, um, of the Cambin triangle and pushes, um, puts pressure on the exiting nerve root. So be sure you start a little bit cranial caudal a cranial in, in caudal direction and you stay posterior. Hey, uh, Paul, uh, also from here, a fantastic talk. Quick question for uh, both uh, you and Ralph. Um, after I deploy the cage and retrofill the cage uh, for my cases, I typically also take a quick peek at the foramen and the, and the, and the uh, canal. Um, again, I do mainly thoracic fusions, but um, do you guys have have you guys seen any any retro of uh, any flow into the canal of bone graft? Because I you know I've seen it like once or twice, uh, and for that reason I always check again on the way out the canal. And I think you know Ralph uh, Paul, I think you kind of showed it on your video. But do you when you go transfermally, do you typically put the scope in one more time, making sure you see the exiting nerve root, traversing nerve root, and there's no bone graft? Yes, thank you for reminding me. I, I knew I forgot something, but yeah, no, that's actually, I think, uh, of paramount importance. Inspect your work. You want to make sure that graph material hasn't extruded out where it shouldn't go, or in deploying the cage and expanding that maybe some disc material didn't make its way into the canal or uh, under the exiting roof. So absolutely, that's a great point, and I always do it. I always do that too, Chris. Okay, cool. So, thank you. Amazing talk, Paul. This is really... I think this is it's very, very convincing. Uh, and I think one thing about the flare hook, which I like, is it basically corrects our, our channel discectomy, where we typically do violate the end plate a little bit of the middle with the drills. Uh, and it kind of puts the, the hawks into the side of the end plate that were not destroyed by the surgeon. Uh, and so I think that's, um, I think that really helps too. So I'm very curious about the long-term results. It's going to be fun.